Let's begin. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you as always to say thank you. Thank you for giving us this time period of Advent to pause and to take time to be in your house, uh, to spend time repenting of our sins, recognizing uh, that we are desperately in need all the time of what you give in Christ. As Micah points us to the importance of repentance, the importance of a, an active life of faith, and also turning from all idolatries, Lord, open our ears, our hearts, and our minds to receive the message that Micah <coughs> proclaims so that uh, we may turn from our sinful ways and follow you. Lord, help us to live in forgiveness, to go and sin no more, and to rest in your care and keeping. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we are on Micah chapter 2. Uh, if you're looking for Micah in the Bible, everything, just uh, you're going to see that the prayer thing is Jonah and then Micah. All right, so. And Micah chapter 2 comes after Micah chapter 1. All right, so I want to narrow just that down before. for you as well. In just before 3, but hopefully we'll get to some of 3 today as well. So. I'm going to read to you Micah chapter 2 here. Um, uh, if you weren't here last week, just to give you a little bit of a recap, um, and that is, is that the current situation is, remember you have the nation of Israel is divided. You have Israel to the north and you have Judah to the south. All right, The threatening nation uh, that's oppressing them is Assyria. All right, And Micah prophesies during the time of the fall of Israel, okay? But he's in Judah. So as the people in the south are watching what's happening in the north, they become cognizant of this ever-present pressure of Assyria. 722 BC, what will happen is Israel will fall. In 701 BC, then Judah technically essentially falls everything, but then is preserved by God uh, and everything. But in 586 BC, the ultimate judgment comes of Judah, and that's the Babylonian uh, captivity that takes place in the fall of uh, all things Judah related. Um, so this is a time though where uh, there's great apathy towards the faith and holiness and all things that would keep them from idolatries, they are entrenched in it. They are entrenched in turning from God. Um, and with all of that, then they're in desperate need of someone to come and help them to turn from their simple ways. So if you think about it in light of Advent, who is the one who was sent out into the wilderness wearing camel's hair and a leather belt? Who was it? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. And as you'll hear in the sermon today, if you weren't here in first service already, is John the Baptist is sent to awaken and enliven us from our apathetic faith so that we may turn and repent and change our sinful ways, trusting in God's forgiveness. Micah would want nothing more than for that same thing to happen. Unfortunately, he's not treated with the greatest respect amongst his own people. Okay, so Micah chapter 2. Woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. When the morning dawns, they perform it because it is in the power of their hand. I'll just stop there for a second. So you're literally picturing, he's saying, woe to you guys. Ladies, guys, everything, everybody, woe to you because you're literally spending time while you're laying in bed at night plotting evil, okay? This isn't, this isn't laying in bed, looking at the ceiling, worrying or counting sheep or any of those things. No, you're literally lying in bed at night and you're plotting evil, okay? They covet fields and seize them and houses and take them away. They oppress a man in his house, a man in his inheritance. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, against this family I am devising disaster, from which you cannot remove your necks, and you shall not walk haughtily, for it will be a time of disaster. In that day, 
they shall take up a taunt song against you and moan bitterly and say, we are utterly ruined. He changes the portion of my people, how he removes it from me. To an apostate he allots our fields, therefore you will have none to cast the line by lot in the assembly of the Lord. Do not preach, thus they preach. One should not preach of such things. Disgrace will not overtake you. All right? They don't want to hear what isn't what they want to hear. They want to hear that everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be hunky-dory. That everything is going to be prosperity galore. That's what they want to hear. So what they're saying here is, is that they're saying, do not preach. They're literally telling Micah, don't preach, because all you've got to say is bad news, and we don't want to hear it. There you go. Should this be said, O house of Jacob, has the Lord grown impatient? Are these his deeds? Do not my words do good to him who walks uprightly? <coughs> but lately my people have risen up as an enemy. You strip the rich robe from those who pass by trustingly with no thought of war. The women of my people you drive out from their delightful houses. From their young children you take away my splendor forever. Arise and go, for this is no place to rest. Because of uncleanness that destroys with a grievous destruction, if a man should go about and utter wind and lies, saying, I will preach to you of wine and strong drink. All right? What do they want to hear? Of the land flowing with not milk and honey, beer and wine. That's what they want to hear of. All right? That's what, they, that's what they want. He would be the preacher for this people. Yeah, exactly. I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will gather the remnant of Israel. I will set them together like sheep in a fold, like a flock in its pasture, a noisy multitude of men. He who opens the breach goes up before them. They break through and pass the gate, going out by it. Their king passes on before them, the Lord at their head. All right. So look at your questions there. There's a lot to go through here. The Israelites were not only were guilty of committing adultery, they planned evil against their fellow Israelites. They're not even planning evil against the enemy. They're planning evil against their own people. So... What do you think happens to the unity of an environment where people are lying in bed plotting evil against their own people? What's the result? Does anybody trust anybody? No, absolutely not. The people don't trust their leaders. The leaders don't trust their people. The neighbors don't trust their neighbors. You go to church, you don't trust the people who are seated next to you. This is what happens when you see evil at its worst. And it says that there's great coveting, coveting fields and seizing them. You might remember the story of Naboth's vineyard. Everything. And so you've got Ahab, and he's all excited about it. He sees, he looks out, and he sees Naboth's vineyard, and he's like, hmm, looks like a nice vineyard. I think I want that. And so what does he do? He has a problem. He's not able to have it because it's not his own. So then he goes and he does what? He whines and cries like a little baby. That's what he does. And Jezebel walks in while he's having a little hissy, hissy fit. And then Jezebel says, well, I got a plan. Why don't we just have a little party for Naboth and everything and then call all these people to the party and then they can uh, falsely accuse him of all these nasty things and then we can just do away with Naboth because then he'll be a criminal. So that's what they do. They do away with Naboth and everything. And then Ahab's like, whoa, look, it's a vineyard. It's all mine now. That's the evil plotting that goes on here, the coveting. I'm looking at somebody else's land and I'm like, whoa, that's a better piece of land. I want it. Everything. So now you have all of that. So the lack of trust, all this going on together, everything, and the greed that is so evident here uh, amongst the people at the time. Why were they confident that their plans would have success? We got the power. We can do whatever we want. They had the power to do it in their mind. 
We can do whatever we want. We don't need anyone to tell us to do. Micah, what are you thinking about here? Robert? I was going to say, part of this could come from the fact that when they went into the promised land, the Lord really blessed them. Their herds grew and, and they got rich and they got powerful because the enemies they defeated. And I think it all went to their head. Oh, absolutely. Why would it not? Right. Yeah. And they, this is where you get the arrogance of we're God's people. We can do whatever we want, but also we're God's people. Everything we're better than everybody else. But the problem is, is that when that actually kind of gets enculturated into the people as well, and then they start behaving that way even towards each other. You know, I've got this almost arrogant attitude even towards my fellow neighbor who is a fellow Israelite. Okay, so this is not a pretty picture here. Um, what will the Lord do to Israel and Judah because of their unrepentance? What's going to be the result? I told you there, 586 B.C., what is going to be the result for their behavior? Right. Yep, they're going to be, well, dest destruction, but also captivity, the Babylonian captivity. They're going to be sent from their land, okay? God's people will go into captivity. Now, here's the thing. That doesn't happen for another hundred plus years. So no, everything, they probably did what? Not probably, we know it as we page through scripture. They got worse. They didn't get better. They continued to be disobedient towards God. And the kings that were raised up, we know there's very few, as you page through scripture and look at the kings, there's very few that actually try and turn the people towards God. Now, we do know that during Micah's time was Hezekiah. Hezekiah did do his best job to try and turn the people towards God. But what he found was the people were so sick and twisted by that point, they wouldn't turn. They wouldn't turn. You can remember the uh, King Josiah. He would be another example of a good king and stuff like that. But it's very few. There's most of them. If you go through the kings, the book of Kings, everything says, and they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. It's usually a pretty short line, actually, about I'm like, wow, what a legacy. Scripture actually declares that you did evil in the eyes of the Lord. That's it. That's your story. <clears throat> All right. God's plan for his people is of what nature? Disaster. Disaster is going to come upon you because of this. Do you think as you go through like an Old Testament text, and I know like this gets really dark and everybody really would really probably prefer a more cheery text, but the season of Advent is not a time of cheeriness in the sense that we understand it from an American culture. We think of this time as a time to be happy and jolly, but for the wrong reasons, for consumerism, for capitalism, for wealth, for power, instead of the time of joy that we have is secured for us in a savior that saves us from sins. The season of Advent, it's always kind of striking to me, it's almost kind of frustrating to me, but the season of Advent is four weeks, the season of Christmas is two. You know, and I'm just like, man, I can't even get all the Christmas hymns in, you know, and as I'm going through. Wanda, you know, probably feels the same way, and she's playing up there. Well, Pastor Glass, are we going to play this one? He hasn't played that one in 13 years. So if that happens, let me know, by the way. Um, but the thing is, is that we're building up to a time, but it's a time of repentance. It's a time of us to realize that there's some definite need for, as I say in the sermon today, some definite need for some construction of our lives to change the pattern of which we're living in. And if we just truck right on through Advent and just think, hey, I can just go about this from a consumer mentality, then we continue to miss the point of what the season is about. I don't know about you, but I really, really struggle with pausing in Advent and repenting because the pace is so fast. Then I ask myself the question of, when is it ever slow? <laughs> if we're not going to take pauses for repentance, it really makes it difficult. So, All right, so, again, disaster, that's what's going to happen. So Assyria is going to destroy Samaria. Samaria, remember, is the capital of Israel. That's 722. 701, you've got the destruction of Jerusalem, or 
the attack on Jerusalem rather, and then the destruction of Jerusalem falls on 586 BC. I'll let you read uh, those portions and other portions of the text on your own. The ungodly in Israel will have no share in God's eternal blessings. None whatsoever. Why? They've rejected God. This is the penalty that you pay for rejecting a Savior. Is that there will be no eternal blessings for you. Yeah, Robert. Did the Jews to this day understand that? Well, do they give an indication that they do? Well, I mean, those that don't, that are still waiting for Christ. Okay, so if you're still waiting for Christ and you reject Jesus as the Christ, what does that mean for your eternal blessing? You don't have it. You don't have it. That's, what, don't. I'm at, that's what I'm saying. Yep, so your question there is rhetorical. My question was, do the Jews understand that at all, do you think? Well, if they understood it, they would believe, yeah. they would believe it. You would think. Mm -hmm. Now they might understand you know, everything. I don't have a lot of interaction with Jews and everything. A couple of different interactions in life. But in those instances, I always question how they can't understand it. Um, we were reading in our devotion the other day at home. Was that home? Catechesis? Some devotion that I was leading. All right. In that devotion, though, is right after the resurrection and what actually took place. The Jews spread what rumor? Jesus was stolen. Exactly. The, the disciples stole the body, mm -hmm. and that is what has been passed down. And it said, I believe the text says, it is still be still that story to this day, or however it is. That that's still the story to this day. They stole the body. Yeah. My favorite one, though, is the Islamic story and everything where they send in, Jesus is about ready to die on the cross, and right before they do, they send in the body double, and then he dies on the cross. That's another story for another day. All right? <laughs> but, all right. Enough on body doubles. All right? Let's go to number six. According to verses six through 11, against whom were the prophets of Israel sinning? Whom were the prophets of of Israel sinning against their own people, you know, and, and, and I liken this to the text you get, uh, I believe it's Matthew chapter 6 uh, later on, of it is better to tie a millstone around your neck than to lead one of these little ones astray. That's the rule of a false prophet. It would be better that they would tie a millstone around their neck and be drowned in the sea than do what they're doing. But you're going to see as you go through this text what exactly they were doing. These false prophets were walking around and they were giving what itching ears wanted to hear. And the response of the people was then to... Line their pockets. Oh, you gave me good news. This actually happens a lot in Africa, unfortunately, with the Pentecostals. Because what they'll do is they'll say, you know, someone will come to them, I am sick, I have this bad thing. Oh, give this money to the church and everything, and God will bless you. And bless you in the terms of either monetarily or with regard to health. Week goes by, nothing happens. Person returns to the clergy. What do they say? It didn't work. Well, you didn't have enough faith. You need to believe harder. And while you're at it, pay more. And then God will bless you. Which is always kind of crazy. You remember the average, you know, in that area of the world, everything, the average daily wage is $5 a day for a working person. And they'll usually say, according to Pastor May, he still, as he said, they'll ask for $10, which is two days' wages and stuff like that and everything. So the reality is, this is what's happening in Micah's time as well. Remember we said last week, history repeats itself. There's nothing new under the sun. These false prophets are going around. They're sinning against their own people. 
All right? They stole the cloaks of the men of the land who were unsuspecting and vulnerable. They robbed women of their homes. They also robbed the children of God's blessings, both physical and spiritual. They were always in it for themselves. So what message do the people not want Micah to prophesy about? What do you not want me to prophesy or to preach about? What do you not want me, as your pastor, to preach about? You don't want me to preach the word repent. You might want to skip today's service. <laughs> don't. <laughs> the very message that we don't want to hear is the very message that we need to hear. Which is why for Micah, as much as he's called by God to speak this message to the people. He's not called by the people in the sense of the people are calling him. We just want to hear what we want to hear. All right? If I were to get up in the pulpit and I were to just say warm, fuzzy thoughts to you and say, you know what? You're all doing pretty good. Keep up the good work and everything. If you keep up the good work, you all, then you're going to be able to uh, be in heaven someday and everything. And, but right now, I just want to tell you, you're really doing a great job. And, uh, and by the way, Jesus loves you, and so don't worry about your sins. What? What? Any church that does not preach the forgiveness of sins and does not preach the message of repentance is not faithful to what the scriptures actually declare, which is what? Both law and gospel. Nobody likes to hear the law. Nobody does. Why? It shows our sins. When we are shown our sins, we are shown that we need something. We don't like to think that we need anything. We like to think that we know everything and have everything that we need, and we're doing just fine on our own. That's our own idolatry. So we get to number eight here. Is Mike explain how every word of the Lord from the Lord is good for all who walk uprightly by faith. It is good to hear the law. It is good to hear the gospel. That's why you have the structure of a sermon the way that it is. All right. Typically, a sermon is structured in law and gospel. So you are showing your save, showing your sin shown your need for a savior, and then pronounce the gospel so you know you are a forgiven sinner. And so you walk out not saying, well, I'm doing pretty good on my own, everything, that sermon made me feel really good about myself. Instead, it's, no, I am a forgiven sinner. All my sins are removed, and it's because of Jesus that I'm actually able to continue on in this life of faith. And I am nothing on my own, and everything I have is for God's justice is an honest acknowledgement of the seriousness of sin and its deserved punishment. All right? The seriousness of sin. Okay. We have a society today, and it's not a new thing, but that does not like to call sin a sin. We want to call a good thing evil and an evil thing good. You can probably fill in the blank on a fair amount of examples of how this is happening. And when that happens, we don't see the depravity that we are in because what we have done is we have justified what God calls sin as being acceptable. And when we do that, we fail to recognize that we need Jesus. Which is why then there would be no point in actually worshiping him anymore. Because we would not have a need. Turn your Bibles to Romans 6.23. Romans 6.23. Romans 6.23, a very popular verse for this very topic. For the wages of sin is what? Death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's the free gift. This is the best time of year to be talking about presents. What's great about presents is you don't get a bill. 
right? <clears throat> giving presents, that's another thing. And everything. We'll talk about that maybe next. No, just kidding. But, but getting presents, there's no cost. It's free. Very, very, very. <laughs> Just got chopped off at the knees there. So, all right. So, for presents that you don't have to pay taxes on, they are free. <laughs> Thankfully, we don't have to pay taxes on grace. All right? God's riches at Christ's expense. But what we know is, is that the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We cannot disassociate that line from the fact that there was a payment that was made. It didn't come freely. It is free to us. But instead, the payment was made by Christ. It is not by gold or silver, but with his Precious blood. Holy and precious blood. Yeah. Who lost out in this text? Who lost out in the Israelite society the most? If the rich are getting richer, then what's happening to the other side? The poor are getting poor, and the poor are getting taken more advantage of. Some of us might say that this is kind of what we see within our United States as the middle class becomes less and less, rich get richer, poor get poorer. All right. I would say the United States is not a great example of this. You need to, and the reason is because other countries are far, far worse. Um, Lyle and Sandy and myself and everything, and Wally, um, if I miss anybody that's been to Africa, when you go, it's 40% unemployment. And people are literally banging on your windows all over the place because, and the poor are just getting oppressed over and over, and the people, the rich bureaucrats, don't care a lick as it comes across for the sake of the people, and that discrepancy is just so magnified, so magnified. And you see that as you drive through, you see a large house, and then you go through and you see a shack, everything, and that shack is somebody where there's 12 people living in it because it's the only place they can shelter. But that's what happens in a society like this where there's exploitation <coughs> everywhere is that the poor get abused. Yo, what up? Bro. I was going to say that uh, a lot of governments are like this when, when they get money from the United States or other uh, people that are supporting them. It doesn't go to the people. It goes to the government. Yeah, sure. you know, so that gets brought up a lot of times over, uh, over there with uh, the clothing drives, you know, and stuff that are done here in the United States. Those clothes never actually make it. Right. They don't. Time and time again, they don't actually make it. They end up getting somehow mishandled along the way. They might be sold on the side of the streets and stuff like that, but it doesn't actually make it in a lot of cases. And so what we don't know on this side is the, the corruption that handles in between that happens in between? Um, so, yeah. The, all right. So the next one, number eleven. The false prophets quickly learned that their lives could be of more ease if they only prophesied concerning prosperity. Okay. Micah calls this prophet who only speaks on prosperity to be a liar and a deceiver. All right. This might apply today to something we know as the prosperity gospel. All right? It's nothing new. It's been going on for years and years and years in terms of televangelists are wonderful at it and everything, where they will speak just a message of, believe in God, you get this. Believe in God, you get that. All right? That's the message and everything is scratch your back, he'll scratch mine. All right? That is nowhere in Scripture. All right, I just read a book. Oh my goodness, it was just laden with prosperity gospel. And let me tell you something, it was like fingernails on a chalkboard for me and stuff. I needed to read it though and everything, but I was just like, that doesn't help anybody. If it's not reliance upon Christ and the blessing isn't found in Christ and his blood, instead the blessing comes in monetary wealth and uh, all these things of the world, where is that going to lead you to lean on? 
Yeah, Sandy. Yep, absolutely. Yep, in the in same same church, the, the Pentecostal church there, exactly. Yep, everywhere. Yep, is is the prosperity gospel. Yep, and and it's not a gospel; it's law. You have to do something to get something. That's law. All right. Gospel, remember, is the free gift of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if it's free, there's nothing you do to earn it. All right. Romans sixteen eighteen quickly here says this. For such persons do not, this would be about the prophets, for such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. All right? So if we are standing up in front of church and we're just simply saying all that people want to hear, it's just the smooth talk, it's smooth as butter, it's nice to the ears, doesn't really prick my conscience at all. Well then, if that's the case, it's not beneficial for turning me to a life of repentance, which is baptismal living. All right, Robert, you're about the last comment here because I'm in overtime. That this prosperity gospel is Calvinistic, came from Calvin. Say what? The prosperity gospel came from Kelvin, Calvinistic. Yeah, although... that's what he preached in his church. I, though that may be true, I would say that it goes back to even before that, because well, you, have, you have that type of living all the way back in the scriptures. Right. Yeah. But, but yeah. it was emphasized there, and that was what he built his church on. Oh, that, that's, that's fair, though I don't... Well, somewhat... I still think you have to go back farther than that to get to the source. You do. So, yep. It almost seems to be, I'll do a wrap up these last two real quick. It almost seems to be a contradiction. In the first part of the chapter, the Lord rails against the Israelite sins and promises that their land will be taken captive. In verses 12 and 13, however, he promises deliverance. Explain? The first part is law. The second part is gospel. Come back next week. We're going to get to chapter 4. Micah chapter 5, verse 2, we read it every Christmas Eve. It's the story of Jesus. One verse. But you get four, you know, three chapters of waking us up to the fact that law, the law, with the law of a sin kills and destroys. And then you get this beautiful promise of Jesus. First part law, second part gospel. The Savior's role here is depicted as. A shepherd. If you look at the last verses there, I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will gather the remnant of Israel. I will set them together like a sheep in a fold, like a flock in its pasture, a noisy multitude of men. He's gathering his people. Read Psalm 23. Read John 10. And while you're at it, read Micah chapter 3 because we didn't get there today. So, and you can use the study guide. If you need answers, let me know. So, Calls the blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be and abide with us now and always. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Lord be with you all. Thank you.